Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 12th of May and quite a few updates this week. As always, I have the chapters, so you can jump to a particular update you care about the most. And a huge thank you. So we did hit 200,000 subscribers. And so as part of that, I'm gonna do an Ask Me Anything session. Again, this is not a technical Q&A, that's pretty boring for anyone watching but just a more general talk about thoughts on various things. And we're gonna do that on the 17th, so I think that's Wednesday, at 11 Central Time. So the link is right there. Look forward to seeing you there for a little chat. In terms of new videos this week, really, really important. Uh, something boring, but service health alerts notify you of things that are coming. Things maybe just for Awareness, things may be where you have to take some action to stop a problem with your service later on. So it's critically important you have these set up. Super easy, two minutes of effort and you're done. So go and do it. And then I talked about Windows Laps previous week. So in this video, I actually go through how I can retrieve those passwords using PowerShell, using the REST API and access previous passwords. Maybe I rolled back a machine using a snapshot or a backup. Um, how can I go and get a previous version of the local password? So on to what's new on the compute side. So app service web apps now have auto scaling. So if I think about this auto scaling, rather than it being resource based, hey, the CPU is at a certain amount or memory, this is now based on the number of incoming HTTP requests. So now what I could have is different web apps within the same app plan could scale independently. I can have pre-warmed instances. So as those number of HTTP requests increase, I don't have to have a huge delay as it tries to spin up an instance and do whatever warming is required. It's just gonna be pre-warmed and I can configure that. It's the premium PV2 and PV3 pricing tiers have this available and it is supported for all types, Windows, Linux and Windows containers. For my app service as well, I can now have configuration of the TLS Cypher Suite. And we do encryption. The encryption is made up of different components. There's a component that says, well, how do we share a symmetric key and generate the key? How do we actually perform encryption? How do we create digests and signatures? That's all part of the suite. And some of them are weaker than others. So what I can now do as part of my app service is configure what is the minimum TLS Cypher suite I want to use. So I can say, hey, I don't want those weaker ones used to communicate to my application. Azure VMware solution is now available in the Azure Gov Cloud. Remember, Azure VMware solution provides VMware private clusters in Microsoft data centers. So it allows me to take my existing knowledge and tooling and just leverage it in an Azure environment and interact with many other Azure services. So that's now how I can use it in the Gov Cloud. There's a new GitHub action to deploy Azure Container Apps. So remember the whole huge benefit of Azure Container Apps, there's a lot of benefits, but one of them is very, very easy deployment from my um, DevOps environment, from my Git repository. So this new GitHub action is actually now the default. It's gonna build, deploy the container app from my GitHub Actions workflow. It will actually build it into a repository. It will go and push to an Azure Container Registry, the new image I build, deploy it into my Azure Container app. So it's really gonna do all of those things for me very simply, and it's now a native type of GitHub Action. I should point out, while we're talking about GitHub, they did also create an Azure Pipeline task to do the same thing. So if I'm using Azure DevOps and Azure Pipelines, there is also the same option to deploy to Azure Container Apps. Azure Container Apps now has cores in preview. So by default, if I try and make a request to a domain that is not the origin of the app that I'm accessing, it, it won't work. But I can do a cross-origin resource sharing configuration that says, hey, I don't want this restriction for particular origins. So what I can say is now in the configuration, I can enable cores and then tell it particular origins, i domains that I want to be able to do those calls to and it will work. So that's now available in preview. 
And then Azure Container Apps has init containers in preview. So if I think about what an init container is, it's a specialized container that is gonna run and it has to complete before regular application containers are started on some replica. A replica is an instance that can host those apps. Now I might use that in it to maybe set up database connections or maybe it's some utility, it's some script that has to run before regular apps can function correctly. So as the name suggests, an in init is initializing the environment ready for my app to run. So those are now available in preview. And then Azure Automation now has Python 3.8 support for my runbooks, and that's in GA. On the networking side, so Azure Traffic Manager now has an always serve option available in preview. And all this really does is normally there's a health probe that's gonna go and check, hey, is this potential target available before I return that as a DNS response for your query? This disables that health check. And the whole point of that is it can now always serve traffic to that given endpoint. I could use a third party health check. I could determine the health using my own logic and via APIs update what it returns. So the whole point now though is I can kill off, disable the native health checking because maybe it doesn't work with my particular workload. So I now have more flexibility and say, hey, I don't want you to do the health check, just always serve up. I will take care of doing potentially checking if it's healthy or not, and I'll update what targets you can respond to. Azure DNS Private Resolver is now available in new regions. So there's a whole bunch of them, West US, Canada East, Qatar Central, UAE North, Australia Southeast, Norway East, uh, Poland Central. Now remember, the Private DNS Resolver does a number of different things. One of them is, remember Azure DNS is accessible using a special IP address in Azure, that I can't get to via a, a routed IP. So if I was on-premise, for example, I can't go and talk to that special IP to talk to Azure DNS. Well, the private resolver creates an IP in my VNet that is now routable and addressable. So from on-prem, I could forward request to that IP and now resolve things against Azure DNS, like the content of private DNS zones. Additionally, it lets me go the other way. I can configure forwarding for certain domains to when I query Azure DNS, it will forward the request to some other custom DNS server I have. So now I can leverage that in new regions. The Azure Load Balancer now will respond to inbound ICMP v4. I, I can ping it. Uh, before, I couldn't ping the load balancer. I would have to use a TCP-based specialized ping tool to try and test, hey, do I have that connectivity? Because very often, what's the first thing we do to try and check if something's working? Hey, can we ping the thing? Well, that, that didn't work, now it does. Now I can just do a regular ping to the Azure Load Balancer and it will respond to that. And then Azure Bastion shareable links is now GA. Remember Azure Bastion is that managed jump box solution in Azure that I connect to typically via the portal, but there is native tooling support as well. And I connect to some target resource, could be in the same VNet, could be in a different VNet. There's even ways to cross uh, other types of links. But normally I access it via the portal, so I have to have access to the portal. What the shareable links feature does is I can enable the shareable links feature, I can then go and create specific shareable links for a specific target resource and then give that to a user. That user no longer needs any access to the portal, they take the link I give them, they paste it in the browser, they just do an authentication and they're there. So that's helps avoid the need for them to interact with the portal or even have permissions on the portal in any way. On the storage side, nothing. On the database side, so SQL Serverless for Hyperscale now has zone redundant support. So the whole point is, hey, for Hyperscale, very large performance, um, large capacity, Serverless helps me optimize uh, my spend using auto-scaling well, I can now take advantage of availability zones for resilience. So if there was a certain zone or an availability zone failed, hey, my workload is still resilient against that. So that's in preview. SQL database transparent data encryption with a customer managed key is now GA for cross tenant, i.e. the key in a key vault that is used for that transparent data encryption can be in a key vault in a subscription tied to a different Azure AD tenant 
than the SQL database. This is going to be really useful if I'm an ISV, for example, hosting a service for different customers. So I have their data in a SQL database, but they want to keep hold of the encryption key. So now they can have the key in their key vault, in their subscription, in their tenant, but I can use the key to encrypt the database with TDE. So that's a really useful feature for those scenarios. Also, PostgreSQL Flexible, remember Flexible is the go forward pattern for Postgres and MySQL, now has some troubleshooting guides. So really, these are really useful for a whole number of different issues you might face, high CPU, high memory, high IOPS, auto vacuum issues, there's a whole bunch of these things. Now they do rely on a certain amount of data and telemetry being stored. So I have to have things like diagnostic settings, the query store, enhanced metrics, that data then gets stored. And then through the portal in the help section, I now have these troubleshooting guides that I can walk through. It gives me steps, it gives me nice pictures showing me the issues to help me troubleshoot problems I might have. And then MySQL Flexible now has major version upgrader, GA. So if I think about, hey, I'm on 5.7, I can go to 8.0. I can use the portal, I can use the CLI. It can also be performed on a read replica. And in fact, if I have read replicas, I have to perform it on the read replica before I do it on the primary. So I can go and do the major upgrade to the read replicas, and then I would go and do it on the primary. Now there is also a minimal downtime version of this upgrader. And really what that does is it goes and upgrades the read replica first. It will make sure synchronization is completed it will switch the primary to the replica. So now the primary is running on 8.0 and then it will go and upgrade what was the primary and, and then it can fail back. So the only downtime would be, hey, I, I stop the app, I finish that replication, I fail over, hey, and then I'm up and running again. So I can have a very minimal amount of downtime if I want to. Miscellaneous, so the Azure Monitor agent, remember that is the go forward agent for monitoring. It brings together a whole bunch of different um, functionality we had before, uses data collection rules, or it is now supported for hardened environments like the CIS and the SC Linux operating systems and distributions. And I think they're going to make a big effort towards those hardened types environments. Azure Advisor, remember Azure Advisor is all about recommendations for resiliency, for performance, for cost, for security, for operational excellence. But if I have lots of subscriptions, it can be challenging to go and look at every subscription and look at the advisor recommendations. So one of the nice things to do is use resource graph. And then at a large scale, I can gather all those recommendations and act on them. So it's been available in the commercial cloud for a long time. Now in Azure Gov and China clouds, I can do the same thing. So I can gather programmatically using graph, all of the Azure advisor recommendations across all of my subs, and then gather and decide what I want to do with those recommendations. And then AZAC Snap 8 has gone GA. This AZAC Snap tool is all about, hey, if I'm running Linux operating systems and I'm running a third-party database, SAP HANA, Oracle, it helps me do app-consistent snapshots. And they're enhancing the functionality to integrate things like the Azure NetApp service and doing those restore points, a whole set of features around those. And that was it. Uh, quite a few updates this week. As always, I hope that was useful. Again, thank you for helping get to 200,000 subscribers, and I hope to see you at the AMA. Until next video, take care.